Greetings everyone out there in internet jazz land. I'm the Jazz and Blues audiophile back with you today after a long absence. Uh, I think my last video was uh, just before Christmas and uh, a couple of days before Christmas actually or maybe a week or so. Uh, so, so much for posting every week. <laughs> I'm not going to be posting necessarily every week but nevertheless I will still be posting some more programs so go ahead don't be shy and subscribe to these videos if you find them interesting and today well we're going to talk about one of my favorites one of my all-time favorite jazz men one of my all-time favorite drummers one of our all-time favorite artists period and who am i talking about well take a listen to this Yeah, and who you've just heard there? The late, great, legendary Buddy Rich. Talking about this man right here. This is off his uh, debut album in 1966 with his uh, swinging new big band, as it was called on this album anyway. Uh, and we're going to talk about the great Buddy Rich probably in a couple of parts, different parts of a program, because there's a lot to say when we're going to talk about Buddy Rich. There is Buddy Rich, the man who had quite a reputation, as most of you probably know. Um, there was Buddy Rich, the musician, who was very, very passionate about jazz, who was genuinely, genuinely uh, interested in the development and the promotion of jazz music, very much in love with the music that he played during his whole life. And there's uh, Buddy Rich, the drummer, the drumming man, the, the man and the instrument that he practiced uh, during his whole life, which he uh, a little bit uh, shied away from at certain points in his life. Uh, when he had some health problems, he went into singing uh, for a short period. And he was not, not at all a bad singer, if you ask me, but of course, his main skill was at the drums and uh, he was uh, just unbeatable at that. So when talking about Buddy Rich, we've got a multifaceted person, as we all are, every human being on the face of the earth has got many facets to his personality, to his uh, tastes and his different things that he does in life. But uh, first of all, what I would like to say and start off this program uh, on Buddy Rich is, first of all, I would like to talk about a personal experience. My personal uh, experience of Buddy Rich the first time I saw him, because before he passed away, I was very fortunate to be able to see him three times in concert before he passed away in 1987, in April of 87. Now, I got into jazz when I was about 12 or 13 years old, and I got in through the uh, big band door, so to speak. I loved the sound of the Benny Goodman big band, Glenn Miller, Count Basie, Duke Ellington, Tommy Dorsey, all the classics, you know, from the 30s. Um, I really discovered those, that music and fell in love with it. And so I loved jazz, big band music from that era. Um, and uh, for the first couple of years of my listening to jazz, mainly, I listened mainly to big band stuff from, from that era. And I didn't listen to any other kind of modern jazz, bebop and all that. I was not yet into that. I was going to discover that with time. But... Um, Mainly, I was listening to big band stuff, and uh, being in the uh, province of Quebec here, right next to the United States and Canada, uh, we have, uh, of course, uh, one of our major cities is Montreal. We have one of the great, great jazz festivals every year, uh, an international jazz festival, the Montreal Jazz, jazz Festival. Not to be confused with the Montreux Jazz Festival. They both start with M, Montreux, Montreal. Some of them confuse them. <laughs> I've heard people confuse those two. Not to be confused. Montreal is in North America. It's here in Canada. Montreux is over, way over across the seas in Switzerland. So in Montreal, uh, we have this great jazz festival where all kinds of, of course, international jazz uh, musicians come and perform. And back in 1982, Buddy came with his big band and performed at the 1982 uh, Montreal Jazz Festival. It was not, of course, his only time in Montreal and it was not going to be his last either. But the nice thing about it is, 
When you're living here in Quebec City and the Montreal uh, Jazz Festival is going on, uh, during that week, they broadcast over television. They used to broadcast every Sunday night. They don't do it anymore, but back then in the 80s, they used to broadcast every Sunday night a concert from the Jazz Festival. And this concert had been filmed, of course, Buddy Rich's appearance had been filmed. Uh, by the Spectel group or Spectra group of, uh, uh, of uh, television from Montreal. And uh, when they broadcast it on television, they also broadcast it simultaneously on the FM radio, on an FM, a well known uh, Quebec Montreal FM radio station. So, what you could do while you were watching the uh, concert on your TV set, you could turn on your stereo, put it on the FM station, and you'd get stereo, beautiful stereo sound of the whole performance. So you could watch it uh, almost as if you were there. You had the picture and you had a great sound, if, depending of course if you had a good sound system, but you could have terrific sound in your living room and be watching the show. And I happened to watch back then when they broadcast this uh, in uh, late 82. Uh, on that night I fell on Buddy Rich. And I had heard about this guy because, of course, you know, he was uh, famously known for his appearances on the Johnny Car Carson show. And a friend of mine used to see him, uh, used to watch that show. He used to stay up late enough to watch that show. I was a teenager. I didn't stay up that late back then. So I never watched the Johnny Carson show. But a friend of mine who used to stay up late uh, talked to me several times about this great drummer that he kept seeing on the Tonight Show called Buddy Rich. So anyway, I knew him by name. I didn't really know his music or his musicianship and his drumming. But on this day, when I watched that filmed concert of him at Montreal in 1982 on a television set, I really uh, got to know who and what Buddy Rich was all about. And I just was completely mesmerized by the drum work on that uh, particular performance, that particular uh, show that was filmed. And it is available, by the way, uh, to anybody who wants to purchase it. It's uh, highly available. You can surely find it on Amazon. Uh, it's even available to, for viewing on YouTube, and it's Montreal, uh, sorry, it's Buddy Rich live at the Montreal Jazz Festival 1982. I think it's one of his finest performances, absolutely flabbergasting drumming on there, and the band is in great form, and they just perform, everybody just performs marvelously. It's a very, very good, very good performance by Buddy. So I was definitely... Um, Definitely taken aback by this, and I became a fan right there. After seeing that, I said, holy smokes, this guy is really good. I didn't think he was that good. And it was pretty much my first exposure also to modern big band music. Because, of course, when you listen to swing big band from the 30s, it resembles nothing like modern uh, big band stuff that Buddy was doing uh, in the 70s and 80s, and even in the 60s when he started in 1966. So it was really modern arrangement and it was really music that I found, you know, was like that. This is like music for today and even it's music for tomorrow. You know, it's, it's forward looking music. It's not we're not looking back. We're not playing the old stuff from the old days. We're playing modern arrangement, modern music. And it's really sounding good. The big band it really can sound really thrilling, really good and really modern, really today and tomorrow even. So that really, really convinced me uh, uh, to uh, move away from the traditional big band and start listening to some more modern big band stuff. So I started listening to other uh, kinds of big bands also that played this, uh, these more modern arrangements. And, uh, and Buddy, of course, was uh, one of my top ones. And I finally got the opportunity to see him live when he came rolling down right next to my city here where I live in Quebec. Just across the river is Ottawa, the nation's capital. Canada's capital, and in Ottawa, the, we have the National Arts Center, which is a concert hall, and Buddy came in 1983. So I managed to get some tickets, and I was looking for somebody to come with me, and I managed to convince my dear old dad, my dear old father, who listens to country and western music only, <laughs> to come and see a modern jazz big band led by Buddy Rich. How did I convince him? I told him, I say, hey, Dad, you know who's coming over at the NEC that we, we, you can come and see with me if you wanted to? He said, no, who's that, son? I said, Buddy Rich. And he said, oh, yeah, I know that guy. I've seen him several times on the Johnny Carson show. So again, because of the Johnny Carson show, because of his numerous appearances on there, because he was close friends with Johnny, 
uh, as most of you listening to this know. Uh, well, my father, who was a country and western music listener, knew about Buddy Rich and was intrigued enough to tell me, yes, son, I will go and see him with you. You know what? I'm curious and I will go and see him with you uh, on that night where he was coming. So I went with my father and as I was uh, going towards the, uh, for the performance, I must say I had some apprehensions. I told myself, you know, I was a young teenager back then. And for me, Buddy Rich, I knew his age. He was around 64, 65 back in 1983. And so I was telling myself in my mind, well, 64, 65, he's an old man. You know, he's a real, when you're a teenager and somebody tells you he's 64, 65, man, that person is real, real old. <laughs> so for me, this guy was old. He was like over the hill old, you know. So I was uh, toning down my expectations for that night. I was telling myself, well, he's probably still good, but, you know, he's just going to be playing some soft stuff, you know, probably some mellow stuff. And he's probably not going to overexert himself over those drums because, well, after all, he is 64 or 65 years old, you know. I'm not going to expect too much. <laughs> So I walked into the concert hall that night and took my seat alongside my dad, not expecting too much. Boy, was I going to be in for one hell of a shock. <laughs> because after that, well, of course, he came on and he came on roaring. I mean, buddy, he just, I mean, there was, you wouldn't get him. He was playing at his best all the time. I see the three times I managed to see him three times altogether before he passed. And I was not disappointed the three times. He was just giving those drums hell. He was just playing the hell out of those things. And that night, when he finally settled in for that major solo of the evening, you know, in the finale, I forget which of the three big numbers he was playing. Was it West Side Story? Was it Good News? Was it the, um, the, um, uh, what's the other one there? The, uh, I got a blank. Um, <clears throat> The whatever. Anyway, one of the three big ones that he plays at the end, I forget which one it was. Channel One Suite, that's it, that's it, Channel One Suite. Uh, so I forget which one it was, but he was playing one of those numbers, and he was, of course, started playing that tremendous bring down the house type solo, and everybody fell silent during the solo. Nobody was making a single noise. The spotlight was on, buddy. He was playing that solo, and I swear I was watching his hands all along, and at some points he was going so fast, I couldn't follow his hands. And that those drum rolls on that snare drum sounded like machine gun fire. It was simply amazing. And I could hear the people around me, and the noises I could hear them make was, oh, ah, oh, oh my, oh my God, oh, ah, e. Everybody was just in a state of disarray, of shock, of utter disbelief at what they were seeing and hearing coming from those drums. And finally, when he did finish that drum solo and the band came crashing in for the finale, it was a standing ovation immediately. Everybody stood there, stood up, and we clapped our hands off. I know I clapped my hands till they were, I was feeling some pain, you know. It was hurting because it was just, that's the kind of performance that you were in when you saw Buddy. You know that he would bring the house down every, every single night that he played. Uh, there's no way he would let the audience go without showing off his full skills, the, the extent of his skills on the drums. And uh, I left that, uh, that night and I was uh, in utter shock and awe. And uh, I became a full-fledged Buddy Rich fan from that night on. If there was any doubt, <laughs> there was no more doubt. I even went completely nuts about the drums. I went and bought myself a set of drums a couple months down the road. I saved my money and went and bought myself a set of drums because I said, I got I to gotta try doing something like that. I can't believe what I saw a man do on the drums. I mean, that's superhuman what he did. I wonder if I could sort of do something similar, you know, with a lot of practice. Well, the answer was no. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't do what he could do. I got pretty good. You know, I banged away on those drums for, oh, three or four years for sure. Drove all my neighbors crazy. 
uh, and I got pretty fast and I could play some a pretty mean fast really rapid drum solo but that's about it <laughs> everything else I couldn't get my left hand to uh, really get in sync with the right one like it should have anyway but that's how that's the kind of impact that seeing Buddy Rich had uh, on me I was just uh, flabbergasted and in awe and shock about the talent and I knew that I had just seen a phenomenon. I knew I had just seen something legendary, someone that was legendary, someone of tremendous, tremendous superhuman skill, and uh, something that would not, I would not get to see uh, again, I don't think, in, in, that, in that kind, in that respect, uh, something absolutely unique. And that was Buddy Rich. Buddy Rich, something absolutely unique. And I'm going to stop right here. I just wanted to share. This is where I, oh, the first time I saw him. I'm going to talk the next video about the second and third time I saw him. The last time being again in Ottawa here uh, at a local club. And I met the man. I shook his hand and had, had a brief chat with him. I'll talk more about that in the next video. In the next video, I will also try and start talking about his career and is enormous, enormous recorded output because there's a lot of Buddy Rich recordings out there for fans. If you were really want to dig the guy and you really want to see everything he did throughout his whole uh, career, he's been recorded a lot. Uh, there's also a lot of stuff that was put out also not just on recordings, CDs and records and tapes, but also a lot of video stuff. Uh, a lot of video stuff by Buddy Rich is available. So for those of you who were too young, uh, who could not see him live. Uh, of course, he's on YouTube. There's all kinds of clips on YouTube, but there's also these very, very good uh, film concerts uh, that you can see, that you can watch and listen to. And uh, it's not like seeing him live, but it's the uh, closest thing you can get now that the man has passed away. Anyway, on that note, I am the Jazz and Blues audiophile, talking about one of my great heroes in jazz, Buddy Rich. I'll be back for part two and a lot more stuff coming about the great, great, legendary Mr. Drums, Buddy Rich. So stay tuned and don't forget to subscribe if you're interested in these videos. If you're interested in jazz music especially, jazz and blues, but jazz mainly, and you want to hear somebody talk about some of the greatest artists and greatest recordings around that were made by jazz musicians. Stay tuned. Subscribe to this channel. I'll be back later. See you next time.